I want to be a producer with a hit show on Broadway. I want to be a producer. You're listening to the Producer's Perspective Podcast. This week, the show is sponsored by Hand to God, the most Tony-nominated new American play on Broadway. New York Times calls it flat-out hilarious, and the Huffington Post raves it's the best play of the season. For tickets, visit telecharge.com. And now, on with the show. Welcome back to the Producer's Perspective Podcast. I'm Ken Davenport. Thanks for listening. In case you haven't noticed, we're in the thick of the Tony race right now. And today's guest has two shows in the heat. Welcome to the producer of Something's Rotten and Hand to God, Kevin McCollum. Hey, thanks, Kevin. It's great to be here. Kevin is no stranger to Tony time, having won the Best Musical Tony Award three times for Rent, Avenue Q, and In the Heights. Also the producer of Motown, Drowsy Chaperone, the revivals of West Side Story, Ragtime, Private Lives, another Tony winner, and a bunch more. In addition to picking shows that get lots of trophies, Kevin's shows have had a tremendous track record at the box office as well. In an industry where you're lucky to recoup one out of five shows, Kevin's crushing that average, especially on his new musicals. And last week, Something's Rotten, which is a totally original American musical, that rare breed, not based on a movie or a book. Grossed over a million bucks joining the Million Dollar Club and is well on its way to recruitment. So, Kevin, let's start right there. You obviously have a knack for choosing new musicals that resonate with the theater-going public. How do you choose a show to get involved in? I, I'm a great believer musicals especially are, are not based on any formula. I think people go to the theater to be surprised. I typically look for a musical vocabulary and a, uh, a theatricality. Um, Drowsy Chaperone, who starts with putting a record uh, on the uh, on his record player, and the musical comes to life. You read that show, it doesn't jump off the page. But because I love theater and I love theatricality, I'm all about how do you tell that story um, in a surprising way. And it started with actually the lights being in a blackout. And the first line is, I hate theater. Uh, and the whole audience starts to laugh. So it's all about that initial contract. I look for that initial contract. If it's a if it's a line that I can understand that I haven't heard before uh, in terms of describing the show, that helps. Um, Something Rotten actually was initially called a Shakespeare's Omelette, and then we changed it to Bottom Brothers, but then it made the agents giggle too much. So we then thought, let's call it Something Rotten. Um, and that came out of the fact that, uh, you know, it was a musical about the very first musical ever written. And... Uh, and how you stumble with form. I'm a great believer in form, um, and I try not to do things that say commercial. I try to do things that are surprising, and my belief is if it's something we haven't seen before, it's my job then to put it forth, and I think people want surprises in theater, and then it becomes commercial because they discover something new and fresh. You mentioned Drowsy, that you couldn't read it on the page, but when seeing it, it comes to life. But what are your... What have been your first exposures to some of these shows? Do you see things in a mm -hmm. reading form and then get involved? Do you read things? How does it's it been a myriad of, uh, of uh, different different ways. Uh, one being uh, Rent. I saw a workshop that really was not, uh, it was great music, but the storytelling was not honed. And uh, it was done at the New York Theatre Workshop as a workshop production. They did it over a weekend. And um, I loved the music enough to get behind it. And then when they committed to the full production and Michael got to work longer with Jonathan, the show really came to life. Um, but what it did have is it had Will You Light My Candle and Seasons of Love. And I, I felt, boy, uh, if an author can write those two songs uh, and those two songs verbatim are remained in the show, uh, then this is somebody who I need to back. And, 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 you know, producing for me is about taking writers to lunch and really getting behind writers because the primary relationship and why our industry is a little broken, our primary relationship is the producer and the author because we are on the same, same side. We are all about building a stronger copyright and a better story together. And then oftentimes then a director will come in. Sometimes a director is already attached. If a show is completely written, I usually and with a whole creative team, I don't think you need them. I think then that's whoever's project that is. And, you know, I might invest, I might be a cheerleader, but I'm probably not going to be the producer on it. Um, Avenue Q was three songs and a script that was more written for television. 
and we had to let that scriptwriter go. We found Jeff Witte. Once the writers, I also think sometimes when the writers who write the music and then the author come together, the librettist, and they start to argue, that's usually when it's time to bring in the director. Because <laughs> conflict, I think, creates better storytelling. If two people are really, uh, two elements are, are in conflict, that's often an opportunity to break through to a new place. And so I'm not afraid of that. Uh, I'll work with just writers for a long time before bringing in a director. So typically for my shows, the writer is the motor. Um, then uh, in the Heights, that was certainly true. I went to a reading where Lynn was a smaller role. Usnavi was a much smaller role. And there were two protagonists. And that was a reading. And I saw the whole show. But that show is nothing like the final show. But I heard Lynn perform as this sort of minor character. And then the shifting happened in the show. And Usnavi became truly the narrator and the driving force of the show. So uh, those are just three examples of how different it is. Drowsy Chaperone, I did not read for a year. It sat on my floor because the title was Drowsy Chaperone. And Roy Miller brought that to me, and uh, a dear friend of mine who unfortunately has passed away. And uh, it sat on my floor for a year, and then finally he saw me uh, an evening after Avenue Q. I had just produced Avenue Q, and he says, look, I'm doing 45 minutes. Would you come to that? And I said, okay. So I came to a NAMPT festival and saw 45 minutes, and that's when Bob Martin uttered those lines in the dark, I hate theater. It's so disappointing, isn't it? And the whole crowd laughed, and I just went silent, because when I see things that are very funny, I start to do the math, and I start to, I actually don't laugh a lot, but inside, I'm like thrilled, because um, I started to see how he set the tone that this is about loving musicals because growing up I got teased a lot because I liked musicals and I went to a very uh, sports driven high school after growing up in Hawaii where all through grade school it was cool to perform because in Hawaii it's a great supported thing. In 1976 I find myself in Chicago freshman year the North Shore of Chicago suburb and it's the I, I feel like I'm in an episode of Glee. It is the most uncool the first season. It's the most uncool thing. In fact, when Glee opened, I'm like, darn, I should have done that show. That's my high school. I, so, um, so I'm used to being a contrarian. So to answer your question in a very long way, and I apologize to the listeners, I try not to think of formulas. I try to be contrarian. I'm driven primarily by music vocabulary or a great idea of um, that is about today, no matter what time period it takes in. So it's something rotten is really about Broadway today through the filter of 1595. And the idea is that these writers who are competing like anything to get a hit because Shakespeare is taking all the glory. Um, and, uh, and even though it takes place in 1595 during the Renaissance, during the Renaissance they felt as modern as we feel today given their appliances. I mean, they just invented the, the mousetrap and they, they had a scale. I mean, they had all kinds of new stuff. And that was the equivalent to our iPhone. So I'm having fun with form. Um, I'm having fun. I, I do really well with backstage musicals. And um, a lot of my shows have had a backstage musical element of the storytelling. Hal Prince once said to me, uh, Ken, if you want a musical to happen, get me to direct it. You'll raise the money. It'll be fine. Mm -hmm. Blah, blah, blah. And I think he was speaking to going to people with track records. It'll be a little easier. In one of the first blogs I ever wrote, I took a look at your career specifically and at Rent and Avenue Q and In the Heights, those three musicals, and noticed a trend. It was the Broadway debut of the book writer, the composer, the lyricist, and the director, mm -hmm. which flies in the face of conventional wisdom, certainly for our industry, but actually probably for any industry to go with brand new people that have never stepped foot on a stage in that way before where the risks are so great. Was this a choice of yours? Did it just happen? Um, I have always been, you know, I'm an only child, and I think I have a face pressed to the glass mentality where, where they let me in the room. So it gives me great joy to let people in the room if I have the ability to do that, and they're talented. Um, thank you for noticing that. Uh, I also, that's one of the reasons why I also did title of show, and as well as 
Charles, uh, even Motown. Barry Gordy was a first-time book writer, and Charles Randolph Wright was the first time, you know, big musical director. And Drowsy, too. Drowsy and Drowsy was... as well. And now this one, Except with the exception right. of Casey, who's obviously the most established uh, director choreographer, and I take great pride that I was able to work with him on his first uh, directing choreography job in, uh, in Drowsy. But the Kirkpatrick brothers are... I've known Carrie Kirkpatrick for close to 28 years. When I was doing a show called Broadway at the Top at the Contemporary Hotel in Orlando, Florida, working for Disney, and he was doing street theater at Epcot. So isn't it interesting, 28 years later, actually 30 years later, 31 years later, actually, because I'm 53 now, I think, no, I was 22, so 21 years later, um, uh, 31 years later, I am doing a show about Broadway fused with Renaissance street theater. Uh, and because they were doing Shakespeare, they were doing you know, Commedia dell'arte, they were doing a lot of different things, improv on the street, and something rotten is sort of a mashup of those two cultures, the Broadway culture and also the Shakespeare culture. So um, to work with them as brothers, and also John O'Farrell, who's British, who and Carrie and John did Chicken Run, but none of them had written a musical before. But here's the thing that happens when you're working with first-time authors on Broadway. They are open for collaboration. Nobody gets stuck in their track record. My goal is never to be an expert, because once you're an expert, you feel you have something to protect. I look at myself as sort of a, a facilitator, a coach, you know, a shepherd, <laughs> you know. Uh, and I have, I'm a really good audience member, and I love the form, and I, I'm knowledgeable about the form. So when I hear melody, I went to a music school, I understand what it takes, like what someone like Glenn Kelly adds to a score, uh, and I understand that Wayne Kirkpatrick, who came from Nashville, who wrote records with some great melodies, and, and for some of the biggest stars we have in the recording industry, and he won a Grammy for Song of the Year, and then John O'Farrell, who's a novelist as well, primarily in London, to get the, the energy of those three people, my company is called Alchemation. Why? Alchemy is, is, is creation. It's not formula. I'm not creating formulas. I'm creating rooms where everyone is giving permission to everyone else to be vulnerable. I think vulnerability, and you see it in my advertising as well, is the most important ingredient if you're going to create. As soon as somebody's saying, well, I do this, I'm just this, I'm, don't touch that lyric, don't talk about my staging. If we can't get our hands dirty with each other, we should not do a musical because it is the most collaborative, messiest, and joyous experience you can have. And my job is to keep it joyous. So let's go back a little bit and how you got started in producing. You were a performer growing up a bit. And mm -hmm. then what made you want to leap to the other side of the table? How did that start? It was very organic. Um, and I think part of the reason why I am a, 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 a producer who remains happy producing is I've done many jobs. I've been an actor. I've worked crew. I understand. I've written lyrics. I've written a libretto. I've, uh, like yourself, Ken. I, 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 I don't apologize for my love of the form, and I want to promote it. And even if I'm, uh, even if I, you know, don't have a success as right being a lyricist, I need to know what being a lyricist feels like, so I can understand and be empathetic to the process. Um, so I was performing, and I got to be about 25, 26, and I worked. I, I must have played every so many productions of Joseph. I was Arpad. I was Mordred. I was still 16 years old on stage when I was 25 or 26. I'm an only child. My mom died, who I was raised by, when I was 14. So I've always had a survivor instinct, and it got to the point where I was tired of waiting for someone to call me to do something that I wouldn't grow. I've done that. I've played a 16-year-old. I've played a 17-year-old. And I loved the theater far more than film. Um, and I found myself in Los Angeles, and I applied to the Peter Stark Motion Picture Producing Program at USC. And I got in. I was one of two from the other category. And uh, I got in because actually I had done a show called Broadway at the Top that Michael Eisner, when he took over for Disney, had seen. And he brought it out to L.A. to perform when I was still living in Florida. And during the day... To show. I was getting my real estate license while I was doing the show at night because that's just who I am. And um, so backstage, you know, I'm talking. I said, you know, I'm applying to the Peter Stark program, you know, 
They went, oh, that's a great program. And I said, you don't, you know, you don't know me, but I'd love a letter of recommendation. And he agreed. And I went in and talked to him. And then he turned me on to his head of staff, uh, Art Levitt. And uh, they wrote a letter of recommendation for me to get into the Stark program. And again, that is another lesson for anyone listening. Don't be afraid to take the moment. I mean, you are in charge of your own destiny. Don't wait for permission, whether you're an actor, whether you... And, and I got into the program. And I actually auditioned. I, was, I, I got down to the wire in Mari, as Marius in the national tour that started in L.A. So they called. They had me on record. And I went in and I sang for Cameron for Miss Saigon. And it was the first time I had an audition. Cameron was in the room. And I was singing for Chris. And they were coming to Broadway. And as I was singing, it had been a couple of years since I auditioned because I had been in film school. And uh, I was singing, and I, I realized my voice had kind of lost its ping that it used to have. And uh, so I finished, and I'm thinking, I said, that was like I was average. And uh, Cameron, I remember saying that he, because now you know, we know each other, and it's so funny. I told him the story. He looked up, and he said, it's been a while since you've done a show. <laughs> and I said, yes, um, you know, I've been in film school. And uh, he goes, oh, yeah, it's a Stark program. Oh, and actually I'm working at Disney in the film, uh, in, in, on the film side. I went, oh, that's so much better than being an actor. <laughs> and he did it with love because he loves actors too. But, but the full circle is 1996, who shows up saying, let's do this in London, this little show called Rent with Cameron McIntosh. And we did After Q together. We did Rent in Australia together. And, and, and uh, great admiration and I I love the fact that it was only a few years because I graduated I guess uh, at my grad school in 88 it was 86 to 88 and then seven years later you know we're talking about rents eight years later so um, you know if you're in the business don't be afraid to cross discipline um, it's something I loved I still love performing I perform every day because I have to I have to get people excited about my show and it's not false I am um, playing a producer every day, but it, it's so organic to me, Ken. Um, I, it's probably best I don't understand it. It just defines me. And when you find something that defines you, it's hard to call it work. That's a great, great statement. I'm a little speechless by it because it's, of course, exactly how I feel when I get up. And having witnessed you get people passionate about shows, having watched and having also watched you perform it, galas and you are certainly <laughs> you have a gig for me i'm yeah. available i'm cheap so much cheaper than hugh jackman <laughs> now oh i'd love to see you host the tony awards now that I think about that alan coming chris dear and charlotte saint mark yeah. uh, now look you've had an incredible success rate but not everyone can be perfect sometimes mm -hmm. shows do not work yes with someone who is as passionate as you are and who throws everything behind their shows mm -hmm. how do you deal with something that doesn't work well, you know, I always say to people, um, you know, that this is why you have to love the material or love the people making the material because it's not about uh, – I don't go into shows saying, oh, people lose their money in the theater. I actually think people can make great sums of money in the theater and also be very social with their money. What, where else can you, you know, contribute to something that is, has never been done before? and actually kind of contribute to culture and actually get a return on your money and have it be in a living and breathing thing and change lives. That's re For me, it's, it's really powerful stuff. So, But when it doesn't work, and one that didn't work that uh, I was very proud of, because again, it was the first time authors, uh, was uh, Tom Kitt and Amanda Green's High Fidelity. And this is where I think... Um, uh, I've stumbled twice on similar material. And the other one was uh, Andrew Lippa's Wild Party, which is going to be revived, and I'm very excited because I think there's a there, that show is one of the greatest shows yet to be a hit. I agree. And I think it's a hit just waiting to happen, and I'm still very close to Andrew, and I'm helping where I can on that show, and, um, and having Sutton and Norbert do it, it's going to be very exciting. Um, and again, that show, you know, Brian Darcy James was in it, uh, you know, Idina Menzel... Uh, some of Julie Murney, as so many Tay Diggs, it was a fantastic show at MTC that uh, Jeffrey Seller and I enhanced and supported from the very beginning. But those two shows failed. They both came from literature. They were not completely original ideas. My success has been completely original material. And, and films are a little easier than books sometimes. And both those 
were kind of internal monologues. And I, I sort of have done the math to say, internal monologues are interesting literature because you can as if yourself in the monologue, but it's hard to make dramatically active. Things happen, but the point of view is from a point of view of being isolated in one perspective. And musicals really are about a contract with the audience that are more active. So in High Fidelity, you know, as a book, it's great. And he defines himself through music, which, which is a very singular experience for him. And at the same time, because that's so interesting in the detail, um, he doesn't really grow that much in the book. But he realizes he's now ready to attach. In a musical, the I Want song, acknowledges the need to attach, and usually the beginning of the attachment happens fairly soon. It's very hard to have anti-heroes in musicals. Tommy did a great job, but that's an opera. Just like there's no revenge in musicals, but there's plenty of revenge in opera. So you start to understand the form and function. So even though there's no formula in story, there are some tent poles in how we connect to our protagonist. That both those pieces of source material, I was so seduced by my love for the artists, for Nick Hornby, for Tom, for Amanda, that I never really looked at the DNA of the source material. And I think that's often where shows stumble. Not because it was badly produced or badly written, although that happens as well, or badly directed. It's that the DNA, are the stakes going to be high enough in the need to connect to allow you to sing? which is why those other sh most of my shows as well, including Something Rotten, all, I don't think there's one show I've done, with the exception really of a, all my shows, actually every single one, they're about neighborhoods. And they're about finding your family within that neighborhood against all odds. And you, the show starts with an earthly problem. How am I going to pay the rent? What do you do with a BA in English? I hate theater. Um, uh, God, I hate Shakespeare. Um, to nobodies in New York, these, these these just these earthly problems that we all, as the audience that paid for the parking and overpaid for our glass of wine to sit in a rather uncomfortable theater for the price, nothing against the theaters. They were built at a time when we were shorter, I guess. Um, but that being said, and then they think to fix that problem, they have to solve their earthly problem of I got to get a job or I got to be able to pay the rent. And actually the answer is and it takes the whole show to answer it, but not too long. Under, in under two and a half hours, preferably, please, because people have trains. The question is, it wasn't about the earthly problem. It's that I didn't find, I didn't have love. I didn't find my family. I didn't have my family. So those problems became paramount. But if through song we start to realize it's about finding our family, all that paying the rent, and what do you do with the BA in English, that becomes secondary to how you love and how you connect and how you build the future. And that's aspiration. And that's why I say. So that's what I look for. It's funny. that I was just thinking about that blog that I wrote earlier about your career. And that's what I noticed about those three shows. First of all, all of them took place in New York, in neighborhoods in New York, Avenue yeah. Q, yeah. Uh, Rent, and of course, in the Heights. Now, look, I'm sure at this point, raising money is a bit easier for you now than it was at the beginning of your career. But tell me, think back. Yes and no, actually. There's something that's shifted. In the beginning of my career, there was something called angels. Now there's something called producing partners. <laughs> and I love them all. But now everyone is like syndicating deals. I keep saying, you know, how we raise money is we all pass around the same $25,000 check. And uh, that and benefits. And... Uh, but really what happens is, is I think because one in five shows do make it, well, some reason why one in five, because many of those other four should maybe not have been produced. But it's, there's a lot of capital right now. But the capital comes with a lot more baggage than it did before. Like they want to, they, they, there needs to be a lot more hand-holding. There needs to be a lot more social events for them, a lot more meetings. And that's great on one level because you're building your community, and I, and I think this business needs to be more of a community. And you've done a great job sort of giving people access. Like, this is a very interesting place to be. At the same time, there's only so many hours of a day, and so many decisions have to be made as a producer. And I look at something rotten in hand to God. You know, I have two very discreet businesses that are being run. You know, 
and I look at my producing partners as collaborators and partners, but deciding do we need to order more, you know, salt for the shelves or whatever, I, there has to be someone in charge of that. So I, I, I am very clear with my, my investors and producing partners that I kind of have to be in charge of that and I will inform you. And if you think I'm doing anything wrong, please call me, but you have to let me run with it. I think sometimes if there's five general partners, I've only been on shows with as many as I've been one of three. That's the most I've ever had. And I think three works at a, at the max. Um, my two shows currently, I am the sole general partner. Um, I've been able to kind of create, I think, campaigns and stay true to message and be able to do two shows because I'm not losing a lot of time. Um, and I have to give my producing partners a lot of credit. They have great faith in me. Um, I'm very accessible to them. But I like to do things on the phone and in person. I, I think a meeting of, of, of once it gets over ten people, it's not a meeting; it's it's a buffet. <laughs> I'm uh, I so agree with you. I'm so thankful for all the co-producers that have come into the business recently and supporting. But it's different. Yeah, yeah, but it's it's just it's just time. Time. You need to be able to make decisions fast. I'm a big believer that some shows fail just because it takes too long to to make, make, a, decision. To make a decision. Or they're in a. Or it's like sometimes if the shows are too big, when people would say, "Why are they still using that advertising?" And I'll say, "It's an aircraft carrier." And I was like, what do you mean? I said, well, I look at producing as being in a speedboat um, because it's all about deadlines. Uh, they're in an aircraft carrier. It's easier to just stay the course and hit the rock because if you turn it around, someone's going to try to turn it around, not be able to turn it around, and then they'll blame that person. So there's a very interesting dynamic at play. Uh, no one wants to be the captain of a ship when it's running aground. But if you're the captain of a speedboat, you still might run into ground, but you better turn that sucker around quickly. And... Um, and so I, I, I kind of believe that. But I also don't know what I believe because I keep learning every day, which is why my goal is never to be an expert. Do you think in looking ahead in the future, and I know Rent was the final performance was telecast, and do you see streaming like the Matt? Do you see this as something you're looking into for your own shows? Yes, I am. Um, but there's nothing like the live experience. I don't look at it as a big juggernaut of income. I look at it as an extension of marketing. Because, you know, I, I was around when Copperfield was really touring. And uh, when I had a booking business, I always dreamed about, oh, I just want a Copperfield. You know, please give me a Copperfield. They gave me rent instead. But, uh, which was, you know, magic every night. And what Jonathan wrote was truly gorgeous and was just as strong today as it was when it was written. But the thing, why I said magic show is that magic shows are very interesting. They're still very popular on television. And yet you still come and see it live. Because, and I kind of think that's what a musical is. Like, we have a wonderful sh number in Something Rotten um, called It's a Musical. And it's a love letter to everything we love about musicals. And people say, don't you think that's too inside? And my question is, you mean too inside for people who buy tickets to go to the theater? <laughs> aren't, I, aren't I doing it in a theater? Uh, don't people, the people who are there like going to the theater? Um, and then, you know, if that gets broadcast, you know, it's going to be wonderful. But it's not going to take away from the magic trick of being in a theater watching a show called It's a Musical. I mean, part of the reason about also my neighborhoods in New York is that if I do shows about New York, as soon as an audience comes in, they've experienced the feeling of New York. They're actually, the subtext is prepared of the obstacles, whether it's in the 70s, 80s, 90s, or a fictitious street called Avenue Q, they know how difficult it is for an African-American to get a cab. You know, they because they've just seen it, whether they're white or black, it doesn't matter. They understand the environment in which we're in. So, yeah, going back to uh, sort of my, my feelings on, on how the industry has changed and, and how, how to get people in, in, in the show, I, I just think television and streaming is part of a tool of marketing, just like the cast album. I think cast albums eventually are going to be video albums because why not? Why not? It, we are learning that seeing it in two dimensions or even with 3D glasses is not like being in a show. And, and the reason is, 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 is also why some forms don't work as musicals is many movies rely on the close-up, chases, reaction shots. In the theater, there's no such thing as a reaction shot, really. There's a take. Because we can't focus our eye on a close-up. So one of the things that, uh, seeing it's a musical on the Tony Awards, there will be cuts and you'll see, you know, Brad's face close up and then they'll show the tapping. I'm sure there's going to be, cameras are going to be like sweeping and swooning. 
And even as exciting as that is, it doesn't compare to the excitement of what you sitting back, looking at the proscenium, and deci- you deciding where your eyes look. And that is what's so human and messy and wonderful about the theater and why you have to show up. And um, I say, I, you know, I'll take it from another brand. Uh, when we talk about the theater, if somebody's like, well, what, what's so different about it than, than being in any other industry? And I said, we make, we make the donuts daily. And uh, we are a research and development business every night. But we're masquerading and structured like manufacturing. Um, and I think that's also part of the problem with some of our, our rules of working in the theater. We have to be better structured. The risk-reward ratio has to be, be better structured, almost like a, uh, a scientist's laboratory where we're inventing electricity for the first time or, or a pharmaceutical that makes the hair on the back of our neck to stand up. Because if I can get the hair on the back of your neck to stand up five times during a show, I probably have a hit. Because that's magic. And it only happens in a darkened room with strangers that you leave a couple hours later as a family. Well, speaking of standing up, when I saw something's rotten... It's something. I have to keep right. It's something. Something rotten. You always put a plural on it, which I find interesting, but the actual quote is something rotten in the state of Denmark. Something rotten. It's not possessive. (laughs) Unless we win a Tony, then we can be possessive. (laughs) Then you can call us anything you want. That's right. Uh, When I saw this show, the audience leapt to their feet after the number It's a Musical. I Which ass- happens in Act One, right? I assume you're going to do that number on the telecast. Mm-hmm. That number in the show, though, is like 87 minutes long. They, they've given <laughs> us 60 minutes. So no, <laughs> I was going to say you could have a whole telecast. Well, I will say this: um, cutting that number to the time they wanted was difficult, and I also have to be very grateful to the Tony Awards because they recognized the DNA of that number couldn't be cut to what they thought they had time for, and we found some other time. Um, so um, I guess all the hosts are going to talk very, very fast so we can get that number in. I'm sure uh, that was quite a negotiation for you with them it, getting every I, second you could. I, I want to applaud White Cherry because I've known Ricky and Glenn for a long time, and ever since we let them be in charge of creating the best television show, I think Broadway has never looked better. So I think, again, to recognize what the mediums do and are is also you know what has changed in the business. That's been a real positive change. I don't want to talk only about the negative changes of, you know, isolating different income streams, but one of the positives is we're becoming a global business. Television's helped us become a global business. Our numbers, from a growth standpoint, have gone up again this year, but I promise you, from a profitability standpoint, to the actual person taking the risk, our margins are getting squeezed. That's why we have to change it. I'm not trying to take money out of anyone's pocket. I'm trying to make our risk-taking healthier, because if we have a healthier environment of risk-taking, we'll have better shows, and the talent that deserves to be on Broadway will get to Broadway. A young producer comes to you today or a wannabe producer knocks on the door and says, Kevin, what should I do? I want to do what you do. I want to have the success of you. What, what should I do today to yeah. be where you are tomorrow? Um, take writers to lunch and keep your sense of humor because everyone's going to tell you it's impossible. And um, when they do that, understand that they're coming from their own fear. And if you believe in yourself enough, laugh, take their advice, and do what you need to do. But it's about relationships. Um, um, and... Uh, I, I sometimes feel very alone as a producer because I have to make decisions before anyone's on board to help me. So that's the riskiest time. You have a few songs and something rotten. You know, I had to, you know, I'm in a position where I can, I can, I, I think young producers should make sure they have enough money, not 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 from themselves, but like make sure you have the, 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 the $50,000 to, to make sure that you can actually acquire the rights and do a 29-hour reading. And just because you put in 50000 it's not working. It doesn't mean you have to then raise 500 Producing is not just producing. Producing is, is knowing when you think it can actually be commercial. Um, invite people like me to your readings. Um, I'm, I try to be very open. Um, and if it's a musical... Um, have an ability to show some of the music, whether it's live or a tape, and that doesn't cost very much money. But enthusiasm, humor, and um, um, you know, just try to connect with people. When 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 somebody asks your advice and you disagree with it, and you're a new producer, make note of it. Don't don't try to argue it um, because you asked. And don't know, you don't understand. And I'm like, I'm sure I don't. And I get a lot of that. And I'm like, look, I, I kind of do understand. I don't understand specifically. 
but given my 30, you know, years of producing, this is my instinct of what you're telling me, like, sounds like we've seen that, or this music doesn't have enough melody to it. The other thing a producer does, and I, and I remind young producers of this, they say, well, I went to high school with these kids and college together, we wrote this musical, and I'm going to be the director, and, and this is it. Oftentimes, the person bringing it to me is the person that needs to be removed. If it's, if, and sometimes it's a composer, sometimes it's a lyricist. And usually, I see that because sometimes in the relationship, the one who actually has more talent than the other is just creating, and the person who's trying to stay close to that person starts to become the business person. And unfortunately, being a producer, um, I sometimes have to cause creative divorces. They'll say, that lyricist is brilliant. That music is ordinary. And I'll say, if I got involved, you probably shouldn't bring it to me, because if I got involved, I'd probably encourage you both to write together. Because together, it's good, but it's not quite good enough, at least on this piece. And, and I'm, tell me more. And oftentimes, those people will then go on through their ASCAP and BMI and hook up with other people, and then all of a sudden start start doing other things. I don't think an author should, a young author should say, oh, we went to college together and we're only going to write together. I think that limits growth. And we're only here for so long. Um, so those are some things. But I try to remain open. Um, I try to remain open and, and, and get a lot of unsolicited stuff. Um, and and when I read, it, I have agents around the country who call and say, you might want to go see this. Um, you know, I'm developing a show that I know you also knew about uh, that I, that's now going to Chicago Shakes called Ride the Cyclone. And it's just different. It is so different. It, it doesn't say commercial at all, but it's so intriguing and it's inexpensive enough. I think it could be commercial in the right, the right, uh, the right way. It, it's, it's a sort of a mix of, you know, Glee meets Forever Plaid meets a little Rocky Horror, and yet it's completely its own thing. So, and it's about, you know, finding your family as well. Um, it happens to be about a swing choir that dies on, uh, on, a, on a cyclone at an amusement park. Uh, and that's the opening <laughs> sequence. And, uh, and they live in spirit and they really reflect on their lives, but it's done with humor and grace and redemption. And the question it asks and answers is, you know, in, in the Kaddish, uh, you know, are you really ever gone if you contributed? And I'm a great believer in that. Again, that's my own. I'm driven by death because my, my folks were dead when I was very young. And I am very aware of the ticking clock, which is why I love the theater, because it dies the minute we make it. And that gives me great comfort that we're all in this together. There will never be enough money. You will never be good looking enough. You will never accomplish enough. But if you make people laugh and you create something that wasn't there before, you've had a good life. So stay in interesting rooms and keep your sense of humor. Okay, last question. I want you to imagine that the genie from Aladdin comes to your office now, right after the young producer. The genie knocks on your door and says, Kevin, you have been that person. You have made unbelievable contributions to the art form. At the same time, as you've made a lot of people a lot of money. You've had a very good producing life, and I want to grant you one wish. What is the one thing that drives you so crazy about this business that you would ask this genie to do and make disappear with a snap of a finger. The thing that keeps you up at that. Now, having been in a room with you on negotiations <laughs> and been your general manager on Q, I know there's a lot of things that drive you crazy. What's the one thing that you would just love to have vanish just like that? It actually is not on Broadway. It's in our culture. I would like to remind school boards and politicians that America, the country and the ethic of America, is based on great storytelling, a better way to live. It was not based on the sports model of winning and losing. So I would love to see our educational systems and our politicians start to act in a collaborative arts manner, like putting on a musical. You got the lyricists, you got the everybody has a say, and it's all about the show. It's not about who gets their line in the show. And I see our politics and our school systems becoming sports models of winning and losing. And if we're going to educate the youth, I'd love to see the Schubert organization uh, say to every public high school, if you want to do a musical, we will pay for the rights. So there's no excuse that on the baseball team, but let everybody do Bye Bye Birdie. And let it be for free. 
If we can get arts mandatorily back in our school systems, we will create better people who govern, we will create better parents, and we will create a better civilization. The secret to the world? Put on a show. Put on a show, ladies and gentlemen. That's what I wish in junior high and high school to be part of our educational system. And the rest will take care of itself. I wish Kevin was actually holding a microphone because he could drop it right there and walk off. What a great way to end. Thank you so much for this master class in producing. Everyone out there, go see Hand to God. Go see something rotten. A good luck on Tony Knight, and thank, thank you. you so much. Ken, we'll see you there. I, I'm so uh, grateful that you take the time to contribute and uh, communicate what we're all trying to do on this little piece of land called Broadway. Thanks, everybody. See you next time. You've been listening to the Producers Perspective podcast hosted by me, Ken Davenport. This episode was sponsored by the Tony-nominated play Hand to God. New York Magazine says Hand to God is irresistible, intelligent, and heartbreaking. It's Broadway's unlikeliest new must-see play. Get tickets to Hand to God at telecharge.com. I'm gonna be a producer.